G'day everyone, welcome back to another video on the channel. You're here for another episode of the Good, Bad and Ugly. Going to be going over a round 7 review of the 2023 AFL season. If you're going to enjoy today's video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. That'd be much appreciated. And let's get straight into it. So as always, we will kick it off with the three goods. And we've got to start with the first good. The game of the round, the Pies doing it again. Another classic comeback. And geez, such an entertaining team to watch again in 2023. Yeah, I know the, the odds were sort of against their favour. You know, Adelaide kicking a lot of points. It's sort of kept the door open with the Pies to get back in the game. A lot of the umpire calls, I can't usually, I don't like to complain and talk about the umpires, just let them do their part. But there was a lot of just moments against their way. You know, the no front on contact on Murphy whilst he almost got almost concussed again. Uh, the hold, the high on contact on Johnson wasn't paid. Uh, the free against Moore for a high contact really didn't look like it. You know, of course, the Dugowie deliberate that should just not have been paid. Umpires sort of against them, but as they always do, that fourth term, they just own it. They own the fourth quarters. They seem to just grab a second win with the whole squad. They gain belief and they... Storm home and pick up a historic one-point win. Was a very low-scoring game, only down by 16 at three-quarter time, but managed to pile on the scoring shots, kicking three goals, six to just one goal, one of Adelaide. It's almost amazing just how opposition teams fare under the Pies pressure in the fourth term. You could just see them start to choke a bit and unable to get the ball in their forward half, whilst the Pies went in a roll in that fourth quarter. Darcy Moore leaving his man all the time, taking intercept marks left, right and centre. A few of their role plays really playing their part and, you know, their goals as well that they execute to gain the lead. Like John Noble's goal from 50 was superb. Winning clearances in those important 50-50 contested balls when it really mattered. Another historic win for the Pies. Such an entertaining team to watch and it's almost just like, you know, they're against any teams against the grain now uh, when it comes to fourth terms. Almost just are like psychics, are able to really put teams under the throat, under pressure in the fourth terms. They just absolutely own it at the moment, the Pies. And yeah, just such a huge win um, in Adelaide also with the umpires against them, I guess you can say. We will move on to the next good now, going with Port Adelaide, and their season is truly flying under the radar now in 2023, owning now a five and two record after starting one and two, looking like their season was going to fall off the rails, but they've recovered well with some just really under the radar resilient wins. That's just how I've looked at them the past few weeks, and and how they have played in the past month or so hasn't been the most flashiest or the most highly executed sort of games. They've just been backs against the wall, against the grain, really having to grow out results against some pretty good teams you know betting Sydney away of course a convincing win against the Eagles as we all expected and their win against the Saints on Friday night was a very good one I think it was one of their more better home and away victories these past few years genuinely the Saints are the benchmark at the moment in the competition number one defense but Port Adelaide I felt like they sort of got went to homework on the Saints instead of just trying to play into their favor chipping around the back they wanted to take the game on they Played the corridor very aggressively and just and their keys to victory was not only taking the game on through the corridor, but just sort of playing like a rugby style, grabbing the ball, winning the contested ball at ground level and just smashing the ball forward to the next contest. And your players like Powell Pepper down forward and Dixon, some strong bodies down there, went to work and they're also able to execute off the Saints turnover really well. And their forward half pressure is uh, another asset of their game, which is very good. And of course, their defense was superb. Very poised and composed. A few uh, a few numbers back there. Of course, Aaliyah Lear was fantastic. Dylan Williams and uh, Miles Bergman looked to be some very composed Good ball using halfback flankers for the power. And let's be honest, I think their, their, heart, their start of the season, their defense was shocking. But I think they've always been quite a decent defensive side. I think throughout a, a patch of last year, they were rated the number one defense in the competition. Maybe it's because Tom Jonas isn't in the side. One of the main whipping boys uh, for Port Adelaide. So that's probably helped. But against the Saints, who are the benchmark of the competition at the moment, they really went to homework um, against the Saints, broke them down with some heavily contested rugby style sort of play and very poised and composed in defense. Got them a key win on Friday night. Moving on to my final good for the video, and I've gone with the Gold Coast Suns. They have now picked up two wins in a row and a key win against the Tigers on Sunday afternoon. I asked the question, is their season starting to get back on track a bit? Of course, Tuke Miller was a big out last week, but we saw some big rises in a few names. Noah Anderson having a terrific game, possibly best on ground with 32 disposals and a goal. Of course, Fiorini moving into that midfield a little bit more, had a really good game with 20 and a goal. Matt Real continuing to show his very good development. A good win 
against the Tigers. And let's be honest, I think it was almost a bit of a cripple fight from the disposal efficiency and the foot skills we did see throughout multiple moments throughout that game. But I just thought the Suns were really able to own the corridor and really sort of take the game on through that area. They were able to really sort of play methodically. They own the uncontested possessions and uncontested marks. And were really able to execute off the Tigers turnover as well. And again, the Tigers efficiency really hurt them. So the Suns were able to take advantage of that. There were a few numbers back there, especially in defense that really showed their A game. I thought Will Powell on the weekend, maybe, honestly, I think he could be best on ground. His rebounding off defensive 50 was extremely good. Defensively in the air was great. Same with Ballard and Collins. I felt they are a very underrated key defender duo. And only restricting the Tigers to 48 points. And the Tigers kicked a lot of behinds, but they just seemed to really own the air throughout that game. That was probably their main method to victory. Really able to execute in the third term, kicking six goals, and then just kept the Tigers at bay very professionally when they did almost look like they were going to be making a charge back in that fourth term. A professional win against still a good, tough, solid side when they are on their A game, the Tigers. I just feel they've gotten their season a little bit back on track now. Of course, Tuke's a big out, but they played, I think, a very good brand of footy on the weekend, really able to execute in the air. And a few of their midfielders really did show up. So, yeah, I think their season is really back on track. It's going to be a big game against the Demons at home, where they have been playing at home so far. So good, the Suns. So, a big win, though, against the Tigers on Sunday afternoon. Moving on now to the three bads. We'll kick it off with the Sydney Swans. And it was another disappointing, almost deja vu-like performance on the weekend against the Giants. Full credit to GWS, what they were able to do in that final term. Kick the final four goals of the game and pick up a win that really should not have ever happened. Uh, was terrific for the Giants. So their season is now starting to roll on a little bit more. Very competitive, very gritty, but for the Swans, it was a loss that should never have happened. The stats in their favor, very good in the contested game. I thought their effort and their intent and appetite was, was good. That third quarter, they really able, were able to make a charge. Their pressure was very good. Uh, their ball skills and foot skills is more like what we're, we know about the Swans. They're a very good disposal and a very good skillful side and able to really convert their chances. So it looked like their home in that third team was always around a three-goal sort of game, extending out the lead, but then they just fell apart. And I think it's just something wrong with their structure and, and culture almost at the moment, just giving up these leads and they give up momentum way too easily. It's a bit of a concerning thing. Out of the four goals they conceded, three of them were defensive stoppage situations. They were ranked last in the competition at the moment for giving up scores with defensive 50 stoppages. That's just their weakness at the moment. And weaknesses in a lot of areas. Uh, post semi clearance, they're a very poor side too. I think they're ranked 17th in stoppage clearances. Just those stoppages around the ball. That's where their big weakness is. And Toby Green, the superstar, able to really execute and kick those four goals, win the medal. And just given the stats the Swans had, um, I felt they were pretty competitive up till halftime. Really showed their true colors during that third term, but just fell apart again. And and it's a concerning display to see for the Swans. They're, they're usually a team that's much better than this. Not really able to execute in their defensive half. They give up momentum and goals way too easily, it seems, throughout more of their games, and especially what we saw on the weekend. A game they really should have won. And now they move to three wins and four losses, sitting at 11th. They've got the Pies of the MCG, which are almost impossible to knock off the G, it seems. They're in a bit of a concerning area at the moment, the Swans. So a game that's really gone to begging. And if we're playing the long run, maybe this is a loss that's cost them a final spot or a top six or a home final. We'll see. But yeah, it's just a, uh, a concerning feat for the Swans at the moment. We'll move on to the next bard now. And I've gone with the Saints. And look, I don't want to discredit them too much. It's hard to fit in three bards and three uglies each round. But... I feel like teams have started to go to homework potentially on the Saints a bit. We all know the Saints, as I said earlier, for Port Adelaide. Uh, you know, the benchmark of the competition at the moment, they're rated number one defense for a reason. They're able to really fight numbers back and get numbers back and really uh, do well um, off the turnover when they do get the ball, the ball back. But Port Adelaide seem to play them out of their comfort zones with really playing a bit more of a heavy contested sort of style, not playing a slow sort of brand of footy like Carlton did the other week ago and sort of playing into their terms. They wanted to play fast. They wanted to play with a bit of a chaos ball, panic ball, playing the ball through the corridor as well where the Saints have been a bit more of a boundary side really executed uh, in their forward half Port Adelaide they just bombed the ball in there 
able to win that grand ball, kick a goal. And I felt their foot skills in their defensive half of the Saints were pretty mediocre as well. A lot of poor turnovers. Just felt they didn't play their A game uh, on Friday night against Port Adelaide. And look, it's not really, I don't think, a concerning thing for Saints fans. You know, losses happen. Teams go to homework. But I just feel like now teams can start to take a little bit more of advantage of the Saints. Hey, you know, let's try and play a bit more aggressive. Play through the corridor because that's maybe the method to beat the Saints. Don't give them time when you have ball in hand. You want to go. You want to go quick. So maybe this is a new blueprint to knocking off the Saints. But yeah, again, it's hard to three, fit in three bads. But I just felt that's maybe an area where maybe teams can now attack on St. Kilda. So disappointing loss though for the Saints. But I'm sure they should probably bounce back in the next few weeks. And for the final bad in this video today, I'm going with the Dockers and... I do want to give them credit. They're a bit more of a bolder ball movement side, so that's good. That's what we want to see from the Dockers, but just a lot of lack of polish and execution with their ball skills was what I really noticed on the weekend against, yeah, the Lions at home, hard team to knock off, but still disappointing. They're a team that finished fifth last year. Let's remember, fifth place last year, so we've got to still have high expectations on them and another huge defeat, 48 points. Yeah, they're starting to fall into a bit of a hole now, I think. Bottom four could potentially be on the cards this year for the Dockers. They have some fighters in there, and I really do believe that. And, you know, Khaled Sarong looks like a warrior in that midfield. Felt a few of their halfback players, like Harding Young and Jordan Clark, had some pretty good games. But just watching them play, the turnovers they had, and a few poor defensive acts, like Brennan Cox, I thought, had a pretty mediocre game on the likes of Hipwood. And a few of their role players, I am always concerned about. Their bottom six players is, you know, a bit worrying. You've got the likes of Banfield, who I still question how he gets a game. He barely does anything. Sam Sturt doesn't really take the more of his most of his opportunities. So Lockie Schultz and, you know, Swickowski, a few of their forwards as well, very inconsistent. They shot for a game. Other games, you could see them trying, but they just couldn't do or get enough output. And for me, the Dockers at the moment are just having a bit of an identity crisis. What is their now true brand of footy? Do they want to try and take the game on more? You could see that a little bit on the weekend, but just a lack of polish. Ball skills was something I really noticed. It did almost didn't look like AFL stand with a few of their plays. So they're just all over the shop at the moment, the Dockers, but they really need to start getting on the horse and trying to churn out a few more victories this season. We'll move on now to the three uglies. The first one, the Adelaide Crows. I felt like not only the umpires were sort of in their favour throughout that second half, trying to almost, let's be honest, carry them home to victory because there are a few pretty concerning calls. But again, don't like to talk about the umpires too much. I just want to like to talk about the performances instead. Bad kicking is bad footy. And now that is another loss that has gone to begging for the Crows where they've kicked inaccurately. You look at the losses this year, they've kicked more points than goals. Um, all their losses this year, they've been terrible in front of goal. They're creating opportunities. They're not converting. Three goals, six at quarter time. Three goals, 10 at half time. Six goals, 15 at three quarter time. And they lose a game by a point. And they do have now the Cats at GMHBA this week. And now it's a chance they could slip out of the eight all of a sudden in two weeks time where they look like you know, they could be staying in the top four after round eight or round nine. Just not taking their opportunities in front of goal. That was the ugly thing for me. They seem to really own that first half as well when watching them. They're just very good at the turnover and they take the game on. They're an exciting team to watch, especially going inside 50. Just couldn't take their chances though. Josh Rochelle, a player I love, was showing his heart all day. The work rate on him is fantastic, demanding the football. Kicking zero goals four, though, that does not win you the game. Isaac Rankin showed his flashes. That opportunity he had to stroll into an open goal, that looked like almost the winner. Kicking that should be goal. Missed it, sprayed it. He kicked one goal too. Don't think they got enough from Fogarty and Walker as well. I wouldn't say it's a disaster of a loss or anything because they still have tremendous upside with their list and how they are playing. But now another loss. It's their third of the season that has gone down the swanee because of kicking it accurately. That's just their weakness at the moment. They've got to convert those chances. Against the Pies as well, that will make you pay. They shorted in that fourth term, just obliterating them in the contest, and a very ugly defeat it was for the Crows in the end. Moving on now to the next ugly. I've been picking on them every week. It almost seems, but the Tigers, another loss. Poor loss, 48 points against the Suns at home. I know people complain, oh, we should be playing the MCG. Probably would have played better the MCG, but that was just pathetic. It was one of the worst losses for the Tigers so far. They've lost now five in a row. The last time that happened was 2016. You know, I was bullish on them heading into this year. They just can't get anything going at the moment. Their execution, again, hurting them. 
off the turnover, they were poor. They were just owned in the corridor, just gave up so much ground where the Suns were able to take advantage. And they're sitting bottom three. They're sitting 16th. Like, who to thunk this? This is seriously concerning now for the Tigers. Look, I still think they can make a bit of a charge, start to pick it up a bit with a bit more of their execution. But they're just looking quite dismal at the moment, especially in the midfield. They were, they were getting battered in the clearances early on against the Suns. They had to really fix that game quick smart to get back into the game. You could see, of course, they were trying to play their Richmond brand, just chaos ball, inside 50, taking the game on. And we could see that, but it's the execution. This is where they need to hit it to win games. Half time being two goals, nine, ending up having more scoring shots against the Suns, but losing by 24 points. Points. A poor thing to see. Defence as well was just being very inconsistent. You know, Bolter, he shows flashes. I think he can be a play, but then he just turns the ball over very stupidly. There's so many things to describe at the moment for the Tigers. Just what they're doing in general is ugly. Goal kicking poor. You know, in the contest, they are very inconsistent and poor. Efficiency, where they need to be good, is poor. And it's another poor loss for the Tigers. Really concerning now, is their season going to get back on track? Look, I think we do give them the benefit of the doubt, but they're just not getting it done throughout multiple areas of the ground and a loss now that is again down the Swanee. Their season could probably be over from now, we could say, but a poor loss on Sunday afternoon against the Suns it was for the Tigers again. And for the final ugly, this is one for probably more of the AFL. They're fixturing. I don't know what's going on. You've got the Swans and the Giants, you know, quite a respectable big derby for all the New South Welshmen. This is the game that should be on Saturday night under prime time lights. But instead, we've got the Demons against North Melbourne and then the Eagles against Carlton. Another prime time game for North. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the thought process is. If the AFL wants to be big on Sydney teams, why not play the Sydney Derby on Saturday night? It doesn't even have to be that. Why can't it be something like a, you know, an Essendon or Geelong? The Battle of the Scott Brothers on a Saturday night, but having two games where we all expected to be thumpings, or pretty much, I mean, let's be honest, D should have won that by over 100 points, choked it. Uh, but then the Eagles, pretty dismal performance. Not really too many positives against the Blues side. They were able to really take control. I don't know what's going on um, with a bit of the fixturing and an opportunity where if the AFL want to take profits and everything, it was barely any seats at the MCG. Was well, some pretty poor fixturing in the end should have been replaced by a different game. And the games itself, I mean, North Melbourne's defense is starting to be really concerning now in that game, giving up a heavy amount of scoring. They're starting to enter a bit of a bad patch of form now. And let's be honest, if it wasn't Alistair Clarkson, if this was David Noble still coaching, You'd be out the door quick smart, so thank God. Sort of like the Clarko effect, he stays in and let's they, they are going to be a team probably better in the long run. And yeah, for the Eagles, not really too many positives to take out of that. They're just a young team with a lack of talent throughout multiple areas of the ground that just look exhausted at the moment, so the Blues are able to take advantage. Saturday night, I wish I had back though, to be fair. Probably, again, should have been replaced by a bit more of a better matchup. Uh, but the fixturing, Saturday night. Two thumbs down. Absolutely poor. So everyone, there was another episode of the Good, Bad and Ugly for round seven of the 2023 AFL season. Gee, we are flying through the rounds, that is safe to say. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you wanted to enjoy today's video. And until next time, I will talk to you later. See you later, fellas.